She won most talkative in high school, and she has been running her mouth ever since. Welcome to the Lisa Fisher Said Podcast with your host, Lisa Fisher. Okay, now this is with extreme pleasure that my own provider is uh, in the hot seat today. And it's just taken me three years to find an excuse to get you here. <laughs> well, I'm so happy to be here. So and really, happy. for in Arkansas, you're a rock star for us and such a rock star that you really don't even... Do you have room now for any new patients? We do. And it, I know it seems like we don't because when you call, it seems like there's a waiting yeah. list. But that's kind of any provider um, at this state. I mean, it's just... Any providers has this huge waiting list, but as long as you fill paperwork out, we usually can get patients in even sooner than than we say. Okay. Um, and really, I, I will kind of give the history, Lindsay, of how we go way back. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times I talk to it's people a fun I've never, where I've never heard of before, I've never seen, but they came maybe with a good recommendation. Well, you're like family to us. My entire family yeah. just about uses you. And it started when you had an office the size of a postage stamp in the Heights. Yes. And you'd had your fifth baby. Yes, and remember I miss those you, days. you had taken that little baby Willow, right? Willow, yes, yeah. it was Willow. And she she had to be six weeks old, and you're the size yes. of a fifth grader. I mean, there's nothing. You look like some, you know, fifth grade mom with these five kids, and you had her in there. And I sat down because I was desperate because I didn't have anyone taking care of my thyroid at the time. Which, as you know, I'm and you are too. You're a thyroid patient, but I'm very yes. particular about who reads my lab results because most providers do want a plumb line and I'm not against that. You know, I I respect that. I I do feel like you, you do need to go also by how you feel, which you're very good with that. But I, I remember I kind of interrogated you like you were, do you know what T3 is? Well, yeah, we, we talked about (laughs) what T3 is that. Was that one of my exact questions? That was like your pickup line. So we're at a bar and I'm there with Lindsay. You know what T3 is? <laughs> um, because, Lindsay, there there are people listening right now who have providers mm-hmm. who all they've been told was there's one test. It's mm-hmm. the thyroid stimulating hormone. And then you're done. And you and I know that's the pituitary is involved with that. That's not really the function of the little beloved um, butterfly little, shaped gland. Like gland right? Yeah. that and, and you're good about you palpated my thyroid. So you really... You, you made the cut and then I sent so many people to you, it got to a point where you couldn't accept new clients. So the fact that you can see patients is great news, but kind of tell your journey. You, uh, mom to five, high achiever uh, on the professional tennis route for a while. Right. Did you consider med school? Because you're a high achiever. I did it one time. So I went to Hendrix, which is kind of like the feeder, I feel like, to, to many med schools. Yep. And mo- I'd say most of my friends did um, become physicians. Um, I guess I, I think I had other plans, uh, you know, just in terms of life. I got married. I started having babies. And that wasn't something that, you know, I I, I, I could have done at the time. So I think nursing school, too, um, you know, it provided so much flexibility. And then, you know, with nursing, we learn a little bit differently about a bedside manner. And I did not know that I would be practicing uh, in the space that I practice in. Um, That kind of, I don't know, it it just, it just developed after seeing kind of a need um, of a, of a sick state, I believe. And well, you also, because your mom status, you're extremely mm -hmm. empathetic to the mm-hmm. woes, especially of women. And as we yes. know, thyroid complaints 90% of the time are, are with women. women. Yes. And we are sometimes shunned by a traditional physician who pats us on the leg. And I was included, and I've told my story, that took years to get diagnosed. And so to have somebody who s- validates your concerns of, out of the blue, I'm gaining weight, and I have no desire in sex, and I, I've lost mm-hmm. a handful of hair on the floor, you listen and say, okay, let's, let's tackle that. And so, and it's because right. you, cause you're a thyroid patient and I think that helps. And again, I hope I'm not violating HIPAA. No, with, no, no, you're good. You're good. Your PHI, I but I know you tell <laughs> people that you also yes. are a thyroid patient. And so that helps you understand us when we say, I'm not feeling great. You're like, I get you. Right. 
I mean, and, and too, I think with women, it affects us, you know, because we are, we are expected to do all these tasks as well. And it's not to be anti-man because men go through a lot of this, they're providers and, um, but right. you know, women, women, you know, we're expected to do all this, you know, kids and, and, and house and work and, and we are, we get, a, we become exhausted. And I do think that we carry the burden of, you know, what comes into the uh, house in terms of food. Food has a lot to do with our thyroid health. It has a lot to do with our overall overall health. So we do have a little bit higher burden, and I think that we do get, you know, we do become a little bit more more tired. Um, and yes, some of that is normal. Um, there is some normal fatigue. There's normal fatigue with aging. There's normal fatigue with with not receiving sleep. Um, but then there's some very abnormal fatigue. And I think on the other hand, it's learning what to do. Um, you know, how can we adapt our lifestyles a little bit more because we can't outperform ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's something I, and again, you know, we have this conversation as friends is what was one of the first things that I think I spoke to you about. I don't know if you remember this, but it was about your sleep. Oh, I'll never forget. What it. was your schedule? My schedule yeah. then, I was getting up at 345 and you said something's got to be done. And I, and since you're not going to quit your job, mm -hmm. she said, you said, we're going to look at this like you're a shift worker. And you said, mm -hmm. it's going to compromise your health. It's going to, and it compromises your weight and, and depression and some other things. I didn't have any depression symptoms, but it could have. And mm -hmm. so we, for the first time, someone addressed it because I was telling you then I'm waking up at 3 a.m. And you said, well, mm -hmm. that we can remedy. We can get you some progesterone, nature sedative. And mm -hmm. you got me back on my course. But you said the ball was in my court. Lindsay, you told me, you yeah. said, you have the responsibility, Lisa, of going to bed. Y'all, I was going to bed at 8 <laughs> p.m. And waking, or 7.45 p.m. to wake up at 3.45 a.m. And you even said then, if you have to take a trazodone or something to get you sleep, and I don't know if your philosophy's changed, but you said right, no. your sleep is so imperative. Don't worry that you have to take something. Stop, you know, stop with that and being Wonder Woman and going, I don't take anything. Take it, get the sleep you need. And I mm -hmm. started, sh you know, I, because I was on the radio, I had a lot of events that lasted till nine o'clock. I started having to turn right. those down. And, or I started telling people, I can go to your event, but my, my nurse practitioner said I have to be in bed by 7.45. Night -night. <laughs> and I did. I, my kids read me Good Night Moon was our joke, you know, because my kids were <laughs> teens then. And I, you know, I'd suck my thumb and go night, night. The house would have to get quiet. The, you know, the, the stupid alarm, you know, you'd have a, a an alarm in your house when they beep, beep, beep. Yes. I go, nobody beep it after eight o'clock. I mean, we're done. And I had to adjust things. I had to fight for myself. And I, I remember it happened. So you first told me that like in October when we were changing our clocks in November. Mm -hmm. So it was getting darker earlier. Six months later, yes. I messaged you and said, I'm having a panic attack almost. You said, what? And I said, we're about to change our clocks back where it's going to be late until nine o'clock. You said, later. you're just going to have to have a dark room. I mean, you, you, this is what I like about you, Lindsay. And this is what I want people to do. You empowered me to be a butthole to the other people who might need mom, <laughs> who a husband that wanted yes. to use sentences after eight o'clock or have intimacy. I was like, we got to get that. We got to get this done by seven forty-five. By people. seven. <laughs> yeah. And my family started respecting that so much because my health was on the line. And Correct. since then, so I, that was, I think, was that in like 2015, 2016? When did you have Willow? It was, it was 2016, 2016. Okay. So that was 2016. Um, mm -hmm. I was still battling my weight during that time. Couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then a year later in 2017, I started incorporated intermittent fasting mm -hmm. with a better Correct. sleep schedule. Correct. And that really changed my life. Sleep. I feel like is the football field of your life. It's, it's it the is. playing field. It's uh, people are saying it's more important than nutrition now. And I so I it. work really hard. And that's another thing the benefit of having a nurse practitioner often is you get more than 10 minutes with a provider or you do that. We all know you we run do late. Don't get a two o'clock appointment with Lindsay because she's been spending time because you care about every patient. 
That's how I, I come in the room with every patient. I'm so sorry. I start out with an apology right because, off the bat. But you I, don't have to apologize because you know what? <laughs> You're going to give me the same attention you gave the lady before me. It's true. And it's why you ran late. So I, we give you grace on that. And so that that's why it's really important. People reach out to me all the time. Who do you recommend for a, a provider? Um, for a while, I, I was taking you off my referral list because I, well, they were saying, girl, she's booked we up. We can't get yeah. in. Well, and we have, and the great thing is that we have another two uh, nurse practitioner and a, and a ph- wonderful physician assistant um, okay. who are who gaining training the same. And so, you know, we do have, you know, multiple staff members to um, accommodate. So as we, as our team grows, um, so we'll, we'll be able to accommodate all that. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about it at all. So my point is Lindsay's going to ask you the hard questions like, what's your sleep schedule? Mm-hmm. Because we kind of feel like it, it's a badge of honor if, oh, I only sleep six hours because I'm taking care of my, I'm a martyr. I'm taking care of my family. And mm-hmm. you're like, we're not doing that. We're going to get sleep and we're going to eat well. And now, you know, and then all the other things. So it, you really help me um, advocate for myself to And say, that is an impact. You know, sleep is, a, is another way we look at stress on the body. And that is a way that we impact the endocrine system is via stress. And so if we're going to go about, you know, not sleeping, we're going to be placing stress on the body, which is going to decrease our endocrine system, which is going to impact our thyroid gland and our insulin resistance. I mean, there's just, there's a plethora of of events that occur. What about the moms? And and we'll get to, we really, Mm -hmm. I'm having you on because we're going to talk about lab testing. No, it's fine. To define all all those things. But what about moms moms who are still... You know, one told me yesterday, she has five kids like you, and her youngest is three. She said, I asked her about her sleep, because as a health coach, Mm -hmm. I can go over some things. Obviously, I don't give medical advice. But I said, what's your sleep like? She goes, well, it's never great, because I always have a kid who's going to climb in bed with me. Well, then Mm -hmm. that interrupts the REM sleep cycle. So how how do you, because I was past that stage by the time I came to you. What what do you tell moms at that point? Because you're one of those moms. It is, it is so hard. Um, and you know, there's different, I, I don't ever think co-sleeping is bad. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I've seen so many people get eaten alive on social media outlets. Um, but again, here's, it's the same conversation as, you know, we have, it, it's, there's dogs in the bed that, that will come in too. Right. And, you know, it's the same right. exact conversation. We love our children more than we love life itself. We love our right. animals. We love, um, but when it comes to how are we going to obtain sleep, are we going to prioritize those health events that, I mean, that's, that's serious. I mean, and unfortunately we can't, we can't do both. You yeah. know, we can't take, we can't take three children to an activity at the same hour. You know, right. we can't do those things and it's not bad. It's not cause we're not superwoman. It's just, it is what it is. So, you know, in terms of, sleeping with, with kiddos in the bed, it is hard. I've done it when they're sick. Um, but you know, we always, uh, I think we've always really, um, had them sleep in their rooms and sleep training was a very important part of even when I had newborns. And I know we're at a three-year-old level at that point, but I mean, yeah, well, it's got to start someplace. Got to start someplace. Yeah. But your sleep again, it's you, it's your sleep. And that's a very sacred space. And it's a very sacred space in health. Oh, it, and you know, truthfully, moms need alone time. I mean, we do. You, you, we you do. can't continue to give and give. You get sucked dry. And if it's to go watch Netflix by yourself, you can tell your kids. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And, and it's a guilt. You know, there, we do have as mothers, we have a guilt, you know, like we didn't spend enough time with them. We didn't spend enough. Um, we didn't do what we should have done. And Lindsay, um, you couldn't possibly do more. There's only one of you. <laughs> right. But you know, we do, I mean, it's a self, it's a self-inflicted guilt, but I mean, other, that other mother is experiencing the same thing. You know, like I didn't, I didn't bond with my child enough during the day. So maybe we're compensating at night. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it is, it's a very, um, it can be heart wrenching taking those babies away, but they're, they're going to be there for a long time. And we really don't lose that quality. It's really, can we, can we exercise quality at a different time? I went to this conference a long time ago and I remember they talked about some of the most big quality time that we can spend is when we spend it with, when we pick our children up from school 
and then we're not on the phone and we're concentrating this. It's that quality of that five That's or good. 10 minute interaction that we yeah. have. I mean, it's even just finding those moments, you know. Yeah. Well, wow. Every it's mother hard. right now, the guilt I just felt. Mm. Okay. All right. Mine are fine. They're adults. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> yes, we all feel that way. And we do have, it's just the way we're wired. <laughs> mothers it is. That's what, mothers what and fathers are different. I mean, it'd be hard to convince me it otherwise. Is. So, and that it doesn't is. matter. Okay. Um, the other thing that I think people are always perplexed about is when they go see their provider, Lindsay, and their provider mm-hmm. says, well, I may run these lab tests and then they're going to call you and say everything's normal. And when it's not. Yeah. So we're going to go over, and I have my labs right here that you order. And I do. And just if you do see me referencing, when I see me look over a little bit, I do have a couple of your lab sets That's too. That's great. That's great. Um, that, that I can reference as, as well. As I've told you a million times in your office, you can tell. I mean, seriously, if anyone asks about what Lisa Fisher's doing or saying or eating or taking, my... I tell my PHI, I, there is no HIPAA violation in this because okay, I, thank you, thank you. I, I think education, I know you know that. It's important. But I think equipping people with information is the best way to advocate for themselves because, it, you know, like for me, it was years and I've told the story about not getting my thyroid, um, my Hashimoto's diagnosis because it took four years for anyone ran an antibody test. I mean, how stupid was that for these other providers or how neglectful was it of them? So I like telling people so they can, so you can tell them, well, you know, Lisa Fisher had a hard time with this and you can see now that I feel like I'm a trophy of God's grace that I'm doing great. I feel great. And there is so much, um, you know, I think there's so much that providers here. And again, I say this over and over, we are in the sickest and poorest state, um, Maybe some others have a speed, um, but what they can concentrate on and what a lot of other providers can concentrate on might be so much, you know, they might be bigger things. Um, and it is, you know, I never want to knock any other providers on no. that front because no. they are doing the best that they know how to do in tackling some of these really big issues because they have other, you know, big fish to fry over here. And so that is why, you know, patients might, you know, like you, you might refer patients uh, over to see us, you know, where we can kind of look at the fine, the fine print a little bit more. Um, they are tests that aren't often run, not on the first sweep. Um, and typically when patients come to me, they are existing thyroid patients or they have, you know, like if, if you've heard this story, they're on my, my provider said I've, I've been borderline and we'll check it next, next year. And so when you hear that, that's when oftentimes, so a patient usually comes to me with a set of, and, and, you know, borderline, let's look into this just a little bit more if you have time. Yeah. And that's where, um, this is what I tell people in the South who are my clients. Southerners are notorious for saying, hi, how are you? I'm fine. Because Mm -hmm. we're here for the, you know, free Chick-fil-A and whatever, you know, we're just here to be gracious. I'm like, (laughs) stomp your foot like you're a pissy New Yorker and go, things aren't good. I am unhappy with my health. You know, don't say I'm fine. Say, so when doctors start asking me, how are you? I'd go, oh, I'm in bad shape. I'm constipated, cold, my hair falls out and no one will listen to me. I remember finally saying, listen to me. No one will listen to me. This and doesn't go, feel right. This isn't no, normal. I didn't spend the first 30 years like this. No. And why would someone, you know, why would, why, why would I go to the trouble? You know, I was busy doing a million other things. So when a, especially a woman comes to you in a man too, I think men mm-hmm. probably also are prideful and go, no, I'm good. Right. It's fine. I wish men would reach out and get help more yeah. often because they do, right. they suffer, they suffer too. Big yeah. Time. So the first thing that's typically run in any provider is a lipid panel, right? CBC and lipid panel. In a good fasting lab set, I think if we go in for our annual physical, we might have a TSH, our fasting lab set. Um, We have been kind of trending away as providers um, because that will often be an excuse on why we don't capture a a lipid and a a fasting set anymore is because the patient, you know, forgot to fast. So we're just catching it now anyway. And Okay. It, it, it's fine. Um, we can overlook. I'll, I'll ask the patient, did you have Cheesecake Factory last night? Because that might explain <laughs> some of this. But, you know, also 
you know, we do get an idea of what happens with your lipids and what you're eating. If you're eating a standard normal diet and your lipid panel comes back extremely skewed, you know, there might be something going on there that we need to look at. Um, but, you know, your CBC, CMP, let's see your liver function, let's see your kidney function, your, see your thyroid function. Um, and then let's see, you know, if we have any diabetes creeping in pediatrics has its own little set that they do. Um, vitamin D is becoming very popular. Good. Um, I think, you know, we all tested this before, uh, uh, COVID, but over COVID, I think the popularity of vitamin D, yeah. uh, you know, and how that affects the immune system. I know that they check that with children now, um, Good. kind of do it, do a screener, um, which has made us all very, very happy. I don't like that little kids get their fingers stuck, but um, right. at least we do know a little bit more. Um, you know, the liver, the kidneys, they're way overworked and underpaid. And we want to make sure that those big organs are functioning well. And then, you know, kind of the general lab set that we do at Revive, all of our providers run, unless we're dealing with some more specific things or problems that are, are already existent. Um, is we do a full uh, sex hormone panel. So we look at, you know, your yes. testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, follicle simulating hormone. Um, sometimes we look at, you know, is there, are there any eggs in the basket? Um, and then, uh, you know, we run a couple of others if we are dealing with maybe a patient who has PCOS, but we do run a comprehensive thyroid function uh, test. So we look at your TSH signal, from brain to gland. We want to know if that's that's working, number one. Um, we also want to know with our thyroid gland, how is that functioning? Right. Um, if you're giving me a set of symptoms that look like they might be hyper, hyperthyroid, we want to know how much T3 and T4 are being produced. There are uh, T0, T1, T2. Uh, those that's are right. precursor hormones. Yeah. There's calcitonin. There's all these right. other things too. Um, but we pretend they're not there. Um, know. we know they're precursors and you know, they're typically and, and it is, they, they're not very active. Um, T4 and T3 are the most active thyroid hormones. Um, T4 it's, it's main activity. It's important because it turns into T3 in the body. We hope. We hope. Yeah. And then, um, right. T4, uh, we, T4 or T3 is the one that actually is that lock and key mecha mechanism uh, throughout the body to all those receptor sites. So it's so the that's, workhorse, that's the main one. right? That mm -hmm. sends the thyroid hormone to all the cells in the body. Correct. At, at the T3 our, level. Yeah. Correct. So that's why um, I want people listening. That's why we poo poo you or I do as a health mm -hmm. coach and as a human why you're on levothyroxine, only levothyroxine is, I just go, well, I mean, you may be the one out of a million that it converts. If to you convert, you convert. Right. Fantastic. Typically we don't see that, but you right. may Definitely be. Not. The, my Dr. Baldridge, you know, my guru who I've introduced yes. you to, he used yes. to say that a woman converts, you know, and he's an old time endocrinologist. He's about mm -hmm. 85 years old now and brilliant still, man. Brilliant. Oh, and so dear. Um, I, I, we all went on a lunch date right before COVID in 2020. Yes. We drove to Fayetteville. Uh, but he always said, I think T4 converts beautifully to T3 in women. He's Because mainly, mainly women are his patients. Mm -hmm. He said, until about mid-20s. And he goes, and like mm -hmm. other, other hormones, it starts to peter out. Because he said, that's why if he did have, because my I was the first person that ever he gave pediatric, I, I had a 12 year old and seven year old, a 12 year old who he was diagnosing right. with thyroid disease. And he said, I'm just going to give her T4 now because I bet you mm -hmm. it converts. And he was right. And he said, but mid twenties, we need to keep an eye on it because it for some reason, body. yeah. So isn't that interesting that it also, the, the communication with the gland and the cells starts to dissipate like other hormones as we age. I was going to say, it sounds kind of like everything else, right? It does dissipate. Um, and that is where, you know, we go into the testing. Um, you, as you have, you've done many wonderful podcasts with other providers as well. Um, some that have spoken to the use of testing and, and many, many uh, demand, many providers demand, um, you know, looking at the free unbound uh so, product and that's what's products as well available then is that what's kind of 
Correct. out in in that total wherever. a total number like a total t3 versus yep. a free t3 so the total is going to be the combination of bound and unbound when okay. we say bound we mean that there's a substance that has bound to t3 that renders it pretty much not usable we can't go plug the bound Got it. t3 in okay. and, and into any sockets anymore um and I, I, I'm 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 fairly fairly certain that it is is unusable at that point. Um, I don't don't believe there's a way to unbind the hormones. I may not be here if, if there was a way to undo that. But um, yeah, right. But there is is the same with sex hormones. So once they're bound, um, I think they do get excreted from the body, and it's that free T3 that we really want to take a look at. Um, you know, you can look at free T4. Uh, for the same reason. But then Lisa, we're looking again at, I, I don't like to run any tests that I cannot act upon. Okay. So if I can't act upon free T4, that free T4 is not going to give me any information that I would change my course of action with. But free T3 does. Free T3 does. Okay. Well, that's, that's important to know. So, that's and that's why I don't. Now, if a patient comes in and says, can you please test it? I will say, why do you want me to test it? You know, is okay. there something? Because let me tell you why I don't. And if they still want to, then we can talk about that. Um, yeah, and we probably notes. test it. It is. I mean, and it's a, I'd say a lot of functional um, providers test that. But one of the things that I was taught very, I, I don't even remember which professor taught me this. Never test anything um, that you can't do anything about. Even sense. if it's a referral, but don't, you know, yeah. if I can't change anything based on that, then don't do it. Um, so what is your opinion then on um, lab lab work that is done in a vial with blood or a spit in a tube? Like for sex hormones, especially, which do you prefer? Um, insurance. Uh, insurance will pay for um, the blood test, yes. but not the and, spit test. Correct. And, okay. and you know, and this is again, so this is where I am a poor man's functional medicine provider. <laughs> and it's not even not not really even that. But, you know, I operate with a lot. I take insurance. Yeah. Um, and so and we thank you. And that is and it's a hard it is a hard uh, it's hard to combine those two because a lot of functional providers say you can't do that. And I I, I understand both both thoughts. I do. Um, I do. There. Um, salivary testing to me, and this is not medical advice, this is my opinion, and this is what I am used to looking at. Salivary testing to me is great with diurnal cortisol levels. Right. If I am seeing the hormone of cortisol throughout your day and you're spitting in a tube at home, that is useful to me. Okay. Um, sex hormone testing via the urine, um, via saliva, what that is telling me, it's telling me that they're the byproducts of those hormone levels. So what the body is doing with that hormone as it's breaking it down to some providers that is extremely useful. I can't use that information based on how I learn to dose. Okay. So it, it's moot at that point for you. I mean, you, it's for me now, yeah. if I have, let's, let's go into the sex hormone world for two seconds. If I'm, yep. if I have a patient with breast cancer or who has a big family history of breast cancer, and we're thinking about, you know, um, any type of estrogen therapy for someone with a history, I want to know, and they're wanting to get into this and I'm, I might be a little uncertain. I might want to know how their estrogen and estrone break down. And that's the um, pathway. Pathways. Okay. Pathways to the hormones. So it is very useful. Um, Dutch testing might give me a phone call here in, in about five minutes after saying that. But it's useful for some things for me, Our, but yeah. is not useful for others. Whereas uh, looking at serum, I see what that hormone level is in the blood at that time. And it, yes, it is just a snapshot. Any test that we ever give, it is a snapshot. And it can change. It can vary. Tomorrow. You could do it again, again yeah, tomorrow or after mm -hmm. a, a Cheesecake Factory, and it can Correct. all be skewed. It or at, especially so, women who are still cycling. Yes. Oh, every, you know, um, and there, you know, typically we want to see that, uh, you know, sex hormone testing at day, you know, 2021. You know, we like seeing testing done at certain okay. days. 
Um, I do like to know thyroid hormone. Uh, if I if I'm testing your blood at nine o'clock in the morning, did you take your thyroid hormone? How recently? And, and that's okay. If don't you have. take it. No, don't take it that morning because it skews your T three and it, now it, it doesn't skew it. It doesn't panic you, but a traditional right. provider will say you're on fire right. because your T three because the half life is so short. So it's so short. Correct. Lisa Fisher said, "Don't take it that morning. <laughs> take it in the car on the way home." Right. Or if you're coming to me, you can, if you don't feel Yeah, you're like, different. You know, you're different. We're fine. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, I'd say for, for, for the most, if we're going into to your average for, for, uh, you know, viewers or listeners that you do, um, if you're going into a basic, uh, provider, I would go and, and, and not take things at that time. All right. All right. Well, let's look at, uh, so besides the cholesterol testing, which I, I'm mm -hmm. not even going to argue about it because I feel like it's so antiquated with heart health. So we're going to move mm -hmm. on because it's my podcast. Okay. But sure. what we can do are things like <laughs> you look at white blood count, red blood count, yes. hemoglobin. Those are, a, who's looking at white blood count? Isn't that when a cancer patient is neutral? What's it called? Neutropenic. neutropenic. Yeah. Um, I mean, but for the rest of us, ours is going to be normal, right? Right. These things are pretty normal. Okay. The, now what, what's interesting is women, again, this is a, this is a female, a predominantly female issue. Many women come in my thyroid. I think my thyroid, something's wrong with my thyroid. Maybe they heard you, yeah. um, but I am so fatigued. My hair's falling out. Yeah. My skin's dry. I'm pallor. Um, yeah. And I, I draw a set of lab and I see that your ferritin level is a seven. And I see that your hemoglobin and hematocrit are so low. And I'm wondering, and then you're thinking, well, I'm so tired. I'm passing out. And and your B12, you have pernicious anemia as well. So we do see a lot of female anemias walk in our door. Okay. And those symptoms often mimic some thyroid symptoms. And yes, if you don't have enough ferritin, we're not going to do the whole thyroid conversion, T4 to T3 thing anyway. So all these all these things are married. Um, but our, um, our, our ferritin level is probably the most important thing, you know, with that blood cell count that I'm going to check, um, family practice, we might check other things for infections, you know, basic infections. Um, but because but of acute of care, you're, you're saying care, you're going correct. in cause I'm sick, something's acute wrong, care. but people something's seeing wrong. you, they just may not just may like it, I'm belittling it, but they might come in because a hormone dysfunction that you're trying to Correct. figure out. Most of, except for, you know, the, and the other thing that we look at, you know, going through is CBC. So let's say our, you know, our, our hemoglobin hematocrit is okay. And we don't have an anemia. The other important thing that we look at, you know, we might see what's called monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils on a lab. Yes. Now, what are all those? Those are fun. Yeah. Are, are those they're, inflammatory markers? They're kind of like little inflammatory markers. I kind of look at like the first, second, and third little layers of, of immunity or our immune system saying something like, hey, you know, something's here at this level. Um, we want those levels to be... Um, together, our MEB counts, we want those to be under 10. Okay. And so if they're under 10, then we kind of look and go, okay, that's, that's fine. If they're over 10, something's causing a problem at some right. level. It might right. be an ingestion. It might be something that we're breathing in the air, but it, it's a flag to me. All right. Okay. I see those on there and I've always wondered, mm -hmm. okay, then we move on to the comprehensive metabolic panel, yes, which is sodium, CMPs. potassium, chloride, CO2, are those ever out of range, uh, just CO2 unhealthy people? is out of range all the time, uh, but it's never, uh, CO2 is one of these, um, you know, it's like a blood gas, basically. So CO2 levels, we don't, unless they're severely off or you're an acute inpatient care, we don't even worry about that. Okay. Um, you know, in, 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 the, in the normal healthy patient. Um, and, you know, glucose, of course, that's very important. You know that in your world with insulin. Yeah, for sure. Um, even if it's a non-fasting, sometimes we'll catch patients will walk in the door and their blood glucose will be 400 and we'll go, do you, do you know anything about this? <laughs> I just so, lost my breath um, there for a minute. Yes. So <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, you know, we'll see sometimes, you know, our glucose is very, very low. 
Um, and I'll wonder how a patient's feeling or how often they might have that feeling. Um, the other, you know, when you're kind of going down, walking down that CMP, that's where we're testing, you know, our, our liver function and our kidney function. Um, those are very important. Again, our AST and ALT, is there any acute or prolonged liver, liver problems, fatty liver? Okay. Um, I so think the it, estimate now is like 40%. It's, it's unbelievable. It yeah. continues to go up. The, the mm-hmm. higher your carbohydrate intake is and your fasting insulin is mm-hmm. and your, you know, A1C, the higher that gets. So those are then you're checking those for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You can see it then Correct. in lab work before you, you did a ultrasound or something, right? Ultrasound. We, okay. we typically see it. Um, we'll see elevations. If you ate at the cheesecake factory last night, I know yeah. we shouldn't be maybe saying that, but yeah, you know, just, if you ate something that's highly fatty yeah. or something, we might see an yeah. elevation. Or if you went on a girl's trip on the weekend and little elevation there with some with some wine drinking, that's, you know, we do see that and we'll, and patients usually come in and they'll say that and then we'll recheck it. Okay. So does, okay. Because we are in a mommy wine culture now. Yes. Um, uh, are in COVID kind of perpetuated mm-hmm. that uh, big time. Are you seeing that, are there some markers in lab work when women are drinking too much in the afternoons when yes. you know, the kids are coming home from school? Okay. Yes. Are, is that the ALT and the AST? ALT and then the AST. Um, you know, sometimes we'll even start to see some increases there in our CRP. So our inflammatory markers yes, and homocysteine sure. levels. And Billy um, Rubin would also be with liver function, right? <laughs> Billy is a liver function test. Um, it's, you know, how much is circulating. Bilirubin's normal, but how much is circulating in our bloodstream can be abnormal. Okay. Um, and that is something I typically don't see elevations of bilirubin. Um, you know, that's oh. in some pretty advanced, I'd say that's in some advanced disease process there. But there is a lot, you know, I think to be said about over COVID, something happened. Um and we can go, you know, on this tangent or not, um, but about drinking alcohol. Yeah, for sure. Um, we can uh, we can dance around it a little bit as healthcare providers, but the more that we know, the more that we're starting to know, we know that ethanol, which is alcohol, is a it's a poison to the brain. It's toxic. I, it, I mean, it, that's just, it's toxic. It creates microvascular disease in the brain, even that little number of drinks that they say that we can drink a day. Um, and it is, it's frightening. We know that it can be healthy. There are some very, you know, there's some health benefits to some of the tannins. There's health benefits to some of the but red wine. I'm now seeing though, Lindsay, a lot of that science was, um, it was backed by, you know, the wine producers of uh, Northern California or whatever. Which is fantastic. You know, <laughs> right. But it's the follow the money thing of you have to see who backs these, um, who this research, and then you can kind of see where the answers come. You go, oh, because now I'm seeing kind of the talk in 2023 it's to me hard. is alcohol's poisonous and you really no amount is healthy. And, and I would, I would say that that's true. Um, you know, there has to be a different way to get the things, uh, that we get in wine, um, that are healthy. Um, you know, the other thing that wine does, you know, you think about what wine does it, it actually, it increases some of the really, the relaxing hormones to the body. And so what that does, it decreases stress for a short amount of time, maybe in that evening hour so when we're cortisol at relief, home. right? We get this temporary relief. Yeah. We get some dopamine, you yeah. know, some serotonin. We feel good or a little lowered inhibition. So we feel good. Um, but then it does end up, it affects sleep. When we have prolonged, uh, you know, alcohol intake, Let's say that we uh, I, I drink a bottle of wine or two glasses, three glasses every night for two months, and then I go and I stop drinking it. My brain, just like any other hormone supplementation or neurotransmitter supplementation, it's going to take a while to pick back up its natural function. Got it. So we are going to have some of this like depression after we stop drinking oh. because it takes time for our brain to rebuild itself and to you know resubmit its neurotransmitters. 
So it is important, um, you know, to know what alcohol does to the body. I mean, we, 15 years ago, there was a Dr. Schenkel and Dr. Amen and yeah. the work that they yeah. do. And they even with the PET scans, the brain scans, yeah, the PET scans. Yeah. I mean, it, there is decreased volume to the frontal lobe. They were way ahead it's of their time. Hard. Yeah. That's, that was really in the time that, um, you'd see, uh, people at the retirement village sipping red wine because mm -hmm. they said, my doctor said it was good for my heart. That was about 15 years ago. And now Dr. Amen has said all along, alcohol is bad for you. Marijuana is terrible for you. I mean, like he has a whole list right. of things and people kind of turn the channel and that's your choice. I mean, and that's sure, one good it's thing. A choice. One good thing you, you really have, Lindsay, is you're not judgmental at all. Mm -mm. And cause we've talked, cause I think one thing I have come to realize in the last year, because I am on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, I have pretty much eliminated alcohol because I'm, I don't want the estrone pathway and we've talked about it mm -hmm. and you said, and, and I'm summarizing, you said, well, I, I, I still tell women if they feel like they must that, you know, maybe to cut back or to find a way to limit alcohol consumption during this period in our lives. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not raising teenagers anymore. I mean, it, it it's you're right. raising teenagers at the time you're Estrogen is wonky. Y'all, it's a hard time. It's a I mean, hard time. It is a hard time. Yes. I've been there, so I have no judgment. But it's also realizing that you can live without it. Well, and it's knowing, too. I think it's knowing what it's doing. It's, it's, it's education. I wish that we could all just know. If we knew what it was doing, yeah. would we make the same exact decisions? That's true. Or would we just, you know, would we make other decisions? You know, or would we, you know, maybe just do a little bit less? And this is the same thing with food. I mean, if we knew what it yeah. was doing, would we make the same decisions? Um, and I don't think that we would if we really, really knew. Yeah. You were the first person to introduce to me um, understanding obesogens in fast food and other things that mm -hmm. you, you, I remember years ago said, and I, I, I mean, I, because of my schedule, maybe I've never had really a fast food addiction, but you said, if you're trying to eat right yet, you're driving through several times a day with your family, you mm -hmm. are introducing some things that could compromise their metabolic health. And absolutely. And that's why we can't look at calories because we don't know what our body's doing with those calories, but you know, you could eliminate seed oils if you want your metabolism to work better, you know, and your brain. And uh, that's where you are really good about giving the person the choice. And we saw that during COVID, you allowed me not to take the shot. You said, okay, if that's your, you said, that's your choice. Sure. Great. And if you want to take it, you can take 19 of them. I don't care. But right. you, you're really good about giving someone the option to say, well, this is what I've chosen. You know, whether for somebody, it may be marijuana consumption. I guess mm -hmm. that's called consumption, use, marijuana use, alcohol mm -hmm. consumption, then you find a way to mitigate around that because people have to live their lives. And we have to meet. I mean, as a yes. provider, we might not agree. And and it is a provider's right not to see a patient anymore either. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't at all. I mean, we have to choose to meet patients where they are or not. And if we have a patient who it doesn't, it goes against how we practice. And sometimes we can't see those patients. You, I mean, we've heard about those providers in, in our town. I'm sure they're everywhere. Oh, yeah. I, I had some with you. And, and that's what you said to me on one of them. One of them told one of my clients, my, she had, my client asked her, she was 50 years old, had the 15 pound menopause apron, mm -hmm. couldn't imagine what happened, you know, and she said, I said, we'll ask your providers for, before she saw you about bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. And the provider mm -hmm. said, there's the door. And right. you said, I remember I was in there with you because we were talking to the client, the patient together. And you said, I don't know why someone would do that. And I think you used the, that was during COVID, the COVID analogy. You said, it's just that you may have chosen a way to take a vaccine, but if someone else doesn't, you go, okay. Just so we know what we're dealing with. So I, I just can't imagine somebody cutting someone off because they disagreed with them. I, and again, it's, it is, it's a, I don't understand it, but I think that there are, I mean, 
you know, it's if they don't do, maybe they do believe that they are doing something so detrimental to their health that it is against their own medical advice. And so they cannot keep them. You know, I don't know if that is a part. That'd Uh-oh. be an interesting, okay. actually, that'd right. be an interesting conversation to have and not a judgmental one. But right. but why is it that, you know, um, we can't meet, meet patients where they are? Because I also think, and this is not in some manipulative way, but let's say a patient today says that they can't live without their two bottles of wine a night. Let's say that they, they can't. And you probably and hear that. If, like that, this is not sensational. You probably hear that. Right. And then what if over time, through education, that we can help that patient understand, A, how we might can decrease that just a little bit, B, what that might do to the body, and if we can see it on paper as well. And then how we feel over time, let's just be patient with each other. Yeah. It's It's really, it's extending grace. I mean, it is, you must have people that have that philosophy must have never raised a child because no one's more (laughs) different than you, than your own child. The person that you raised, you would think you, how can they, they be that way? How can they be that way? Yes. And then God has a sense of humor. It's like the person you marry. You think the things I loved yeah. about him are the things that drive me crazy five years in, five weeks How in. How did we pick that? How did we pick that? Right. <laughs> and it's just that humans are so different. Yes. Okay. Um, so we're moving along. Those are all uh, liver. Um, now, vitamin D. So vitamin D has baffled me, and you vitamin helped D. me with this recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot, I, I'm understanding a lot of vitamin D has to do with receptors and ethnicity and I say that because in my case, Russian Jew, black hair, uh, gr- yes. hazel green eyes, my husband, and I say that my husband's blonde and blue eyed. We get the same amount of sun every day on our top deck for 20 minutes, no sunscreen. He comes to you. His vitamin D is 75 or 80. Mine's He's 40. Be- it's just beautiful. Mine's 40. And yeah. mine, y'all, and I work happen. hard and you... This last time I was like, how did mine drop? This is like, I'm so baffled. And you reminded me, my vitiligo it, it's the, had it's the something melanin to do with and melanin. And also they say our native culture, you know, that's why African Americans mm-hmm. have lower vitamin D. Different receptor sites. Receptor sites. So mm-hmm. my Russian Jews, you know, Jews were bitching in the desert all those years. They weren't getting, <laughs> they were, didn't get too much vitamin D. They got just enough to get the just manna. Enough. So that, and understanding that, so you, you're light eyed, light complected. I bet you're no, cause you're in an office all day. I bet your vitamin D isn't good then. But I also spend a lot of time when I'm not at the office, I'm outside. Tennis. Yeah. I'm outside. So so what's your vitamin D? Someone like you. I, so I keep mine anywhere from 60 to 80 every, every single time. I think one time, I think the first time I ever did a lab set on myself, and that was kind of when I was in that, like, postpartum 15 year period that yeah. I was in yes. um, for 15 years, you're postpartum for 15 right. years postpartum that, um, that I did run low. I did have a low vitamin D level, but I was not spending time outside. I was depressed. Yeah. Um, I was anxious. Um, my sex hormones were all over the place. And so I do know that vitamin D and if you look at my state and state of mind at the time, there was a lot of depression Vitamin D is a pro hormone. Um, it is used in the synthesis of hormones. It has receptor sites. Um, it is very protective of the immune system. Um, it is very, very, very important. Um, and when we don't have that, we do have a loss of neurotransmission. We have a loss of sex hormones. We have a decrease in immune system function as well. And we'll also with vitamin D goes hand in hand with cholesterol. Cholesterol helps and the liver pushes out cholesterol and that doesn't that help synthesize the vitamin d it does yeah so you're all yeah you cholesterol is not a villain it's not not a villain um in the right ratio that's right and mine's not impressive but my other stuff is so that's what i'm hanging my head on (laughs) um fasting insulin so i've been asking you for fasting insulin since i started fasting and yes I, i may have been one of your first people to really ask because in the beginning, one time I had a five-day fast, and I came to you on day four because it was time for my last. Oh, yeah. 
and my pellet anyway, and my vi- my fasting insulin, y'all, was 1.1, which is really almost too low. It almost looks like there's dysfunction with the but pancreas. pancreas isn't working. Yeah, but but I think your pancreas just it was two point well two point two. One time, yeah, that was it stayed at about two point two, and um, it may have been July of. 2021 or 22. Uh, yes, I don't have that one. Yeah, it was 1.1 and it even flagged it and said, this is almost too low, but it came back up during a normal fast when I was just fasting yes. my normal 19 and, hours. And when we started to really think through that process, you know, no, it's not that your pancreas isn't working. It's that, you know, what is insulin? You know, insulin yeah. is a hormone that is secreted in response to typically glucose. Right. And so if you're not putting glucose into the bloodstream. No, no food at all for four days. There's yeah. no need, there's no need yeah. to, for your pancreas to do a whole lot. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think, I think at that point we, you know, I think we've done it several times yeah. since and it's normal for a fasting person. Um, but the goal was never to to get it to zero. In fact, I don't even think that you have fasting insulin goals. It just is what it yeah. is. Yeah. Well, um, I would like, I do like seeing, Dr. Hyman says we like seeing that number under five. You right. Guys, if, you, if you are yeah. fasting. Yeah. If you're fasting. So we do. And, it, and here's another one. Um, one of my clients who became your mm-hmm. patient, um, she came one time. Remember, we were doing fasting. We were doing health coaching at your office. And mm-hmm. a sweet lady sat before me. She was overweight and she had already seen a provider maybe three months earlier. And I just mm-hmm. said, you know, what's going on? Do you have, cause she was overweight. Do you have PCOS? You know, it's just a common question. Do you have PCOS or, um, were you pre-diabetic? She went, no, my, and show me her lab values. Lindsay, her glucose was like 98 or A1C was maybe 5.3. Mm-hmm. And so she came to you and you tested her fasting insulin. It was 40. And I said, that's the smoking gun right there. It is. That nobody, and she cried. She said, and then she started fasting. And six months later, it got down to 20 and then it got down to 17. And I can't remember Mm -hmm. where it was, but it just showed y'all just six months of fasting and obesity. You can switch. You can flip your metabolic profile. Totally flip. And that's what people don't understand is just because you get a lab value, a lot of these, you can write the ship with a few tweaks. And then of course it, and two, it's, um, I think it's the, we're in this fast culture, the TikTok culture right yes, now that's where right. we are. Um, we want to see something change in, we can, we can start to make changes, but I think I've always taught, keep in mind, it takes a full year to repair an insulin receptor a year. Oh, that's a good fact. And that's to, to gain, you know, full function. Um, that's, that's and it's really not that I think it goes again. It's let's give, let's give some grace to your body. Like it didn't take, it didn't even take a year to get here. It took 15. It took, it took a lot of years yeah. to ben get Bigman here. Ben Bigman says it's 15 to 20 years before the fast, before your I'm sorry, your A1C is elevator blood glucose that your fasting insulin was giving, fi- firing the warning shots, but nobody was Correct. checking the, checking that. Well, and now think about all the warning shots that are being fired with our pediatric obesity. <gasps> oh, y'all, it breaks my heart. It it's absolutely pretty, breaks it's my insane. heart. It breaks my heart. Um, mm. It really breaks my heart. Okay, the, let's move on then because we're kind of running yep. out of time. C-reactive oh, protein. Let's talk about how important that number is. What, how, how it's just an inflammatory marker, right? Inflammatory marker, it can be, can help in diagnosis of autoimmune disease. Oh. So that's also important. If it's a high C, there's an, a, what's called an HSCRP, which is a highly high sensitive CRP. Right? Mm-hmm. And that's really looking particularly at vascular inflammation. That's what I thought, cardiac, heart, mm-hmm. blood, um, vessels. Are we doing, I, I like to like, I think of it. This is not what it is. This is how Lindsay thinks of it as we have some micro tears where we're micro tearing, we're scratching the inside of that blood vessel. And that's that indicator of that HSCRP. The CRP, when we look at the CRP, if it's extremely elevated, we can also die, you know, or or be a part of a diagnosis of a disease process. Um, But that HSCRP is, hey, is this, is the blood glucose we have um, 
glucose is like we kind of learned this through the Boston Heart Test. We yeah. used to we still you, provide. Do you still run that? You ran that on we me do years still ago. Run it. Okay. The reason that it stopped being done as much is because um, our insurance companies here oh. in our state stopped uh, stopped paying for it. Um, and it was probably the most useful teaching tool that I ever had. Um, we try to kind of get around it somehow, but the yeah. pictures, it's pictures and teaching are a thousand remember, words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the ways that they even used in teaching was that, you know, sugar, glucose, alcohol, those types of things, they are like little shards of glass and they go through and they cause little micro tears. I think that's the um, best visual for people. It is. It's incredible. And you see it on papers even better, um, yeah. but it creates these little micro tears in the blood vessel. And so that's kind of what that number that HSCRP is reflective of is that little micro tear. Um, another thing you did, see, I, you'll, you often laugh when you take my blood pressure because it's like a hundred over 72, you know, yeah, 98 or something. But my husband, <laughs> Mr. High Vitamin D, had high blood pressure for years, but was the of the philosophy of, I don't want to take any medicine. And you use the micro tears in the arteries to explain the damage of high blood pressure for him. Right. And now he does uh, beetroot powder and uh, hibiscus, hibiscus tea. And he's now normal. This is not medical advice, but that did. Right. Ha Correct. And that was ad advised by C.D. Williams, who in Arkansas is a historic figure in, in what he's done as a cardiovascular surgeon. He's retired now. Uh, but CD's the one who told him that. But when you use the picture for us to see, you said, well, Chris, I know, you know, you lift weights, you do all the things, but you could be damaging your arterial wall. Well, and it's the the elasticity of the vessel. Yeah. It's using the hose, the hose analogy. Yeah, if you that keep was something yes, stretched yes, out, yeah. you know, for yeah, that was you got a lot of blood gushing and, and our vessel is kept stretched out then it's not going to want to be flexible. And what do we lose over time? All of us lose over time. We lose elasticity in, in oh, everything. I see. I see. And so yeah. we even yeah. lose, it's not so much, you know, we do care about what we lose here in elasticity, yeah. but we also lose all this vascular elasticity and we, we can't afford that. So we want to make sure that Chris's vessels are able to contract and expand and have right. to maintain but their elasticity. Once you use that to him, Plus, you knew how to communicate. That's the other thing about you. You're an athlete, so you knew how to communicate with an athlete. You knew he, he didn't want fluffy language, and you got right to it, and it no. worked. Okay, we're out of time. Are you going to tell Cigna that we had an hour-long uh, patient doctor visit today? I could. Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> They'll pay you about $9. <laughs> we'll get $9 reimbursement for this. Thank no, you so much, but, Lindsay. No, this is always a pleasure. Thank well, you so yeah. much. Well, we've, we've done these before. We interviewed you for TV. We've done a lot of these, but this was I the know. first time on my podcast, actually. So it is. And I'm excited. We, you know, and there's so much that we have yet to go over. I know, so we're we going to have even, to do this again. We didn't even finish. That's right. We lo Darren loves a part two. So come back. For I know part we're going to have to do a part two. All right. Y'all have a, an amazing day. And thank Great you. Job. Thanks for listening to the Lisa Fisher said podcast. Be sure to hit subscribe and download all the episodes and leave a review, won't you? The Lisa Fisher Said Podcast is produced by ClantonCreative.com.